Hello everyone and welcome to our latest webinar. Thanks for joining us. My name is Rob Newton and I'm the host for this session. Today we're going to be discussing the creative and business approach to shooting weddings and vid corporate videos. And I'm delighted to be joined by Simon Quarry, storyteller, director, Canon ambassador. Yeah, it's Simeon, but I forgive you, Rod. Did, did I say it again? <laughs> Yeah, it's fine. How, many, how many times have we been doing it? <laughs> We've met so many times, mate. We hang out all the time. It's all good. It's just when you, it's just when you go live on air, yeah. Simeon becomes Simon. So, yeah, it's like my mum spelt my name wrong on the birth certificate, and it just stuck. Stuck with you. That's right. <laughs> Simeon. Yes. Yeah, sorry about that. Okay. We've got um, some housekeeping just to go through to make sure that everyone is is on the same page. So. Before we get started, here we go. We've got, uh, you should have a question box. So please use the question box. It'll make the presentation a lot more engaging. You'll get more out of it and it'll keep us alive and make sure that we're answering everything that you need to know. So please do that. We're also recording the webinar. So if for, for any reason you want to listen to this again or give it to uh, one of your colleagues and we'll be able to do that, we'll send out a link to the recording um, probably tomorrow. You may not know it, but we also run some open days and masterclass sessions here in Teddington. So if you want to get your hands on the kit, then you can do that, and you can check those out on our website, which is visuals.co.uk. So please check out for more um, events as we go. So here we go. This is this is Simeon. Um, as I said, he's got 15 years experience of working in the video and production industry. Uh, both as a photographer and cin cinematographer. His clients include people like Canon, Barclays, Unilever, etc. Um, so he's got a vast amount of knowledge that he's going to be sharing with us today. Um, we will be doing a, a poll just to start us off so that Simeon can adjust his presentation to the right level. So the question today is, um, have you made the leap to 4K recordings yet? Uh, you should be able to see that now. Um, so you can, if you would just like to select one of the answers, um, whether it's yes, I'm already there, I've got a 4K camera, whether it's no, but I know I need to get there, I'm almost there, or no, but we need to, I know we need to, but we haven't quite made the decision yet, or I'm not convinced of any of the benefits yet. So um, as you can see, the poll is quite lively, and we've almost completed with um, mm, no, but we need to is, is the biggest one. Okay, so. okay. I, I think that kind of makes sense in a way. I think we were at a point in time where the move towards 4K is coming. It's probably come for, it, sometimes it's come for us as users, but it, we're not there yet when it comes to providing content to end customers um, for weddings or for corporate. Um, so I'm going to keep that in the recesses of my mind and please feel free everyone that's out there to kind of get involved if there's any kind of questions that pertain to 4k etc we'll make sure that we we we, we cover that as as well sure um, okay so I'll hand over to, to Simeon who'll go through the presentation I'll interject when when necessary I think that's quite interesting as well just going back to the poll that we got 20% are not convinced of the benefits yet, mm -hmm. so um, yep. I think the industry maybe has a bit of a job on its hands just to com convince people of the of, of the benefits of 4K. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think um, it's down to your customers, it's down to um, what you need, and you know, it's, it's really important to get that balance. Um, we've already got a, a comment in from Sean uh, Conroy, um, who has basically been, he said as a freelancer, his aim is to keep his expenditure as low as possible. And that that can be a factor. You need to spend sure. money when it's right for your business. Yeah. Um, there are some things I've gone out there and I've spent a lot of money on and I've been first to market with it and it's made sense for me to do it. And there are other times when I've done that and I've actually lost myself a lot of money because it's been an unnecessary expense. It's really important to kind of get that, that overall balance. So yeah. uh, it's been... That's been cool. So thank you to those of you who are uh, online uh, right now um, and those of you all who are coming on board. Um, just so I can get an idea of some names and who's out there, um, will you please uh, let me know where you are from in the country? 
uh, that will be great because as I know where you're from in the country or where you are in the world, if you can start to type in now, that will be great. Then I will see your names come up on screen and then, uh, okay, so we've got David from Glasgow. Howdy, how are you doing? Hey, we've got Steve in uh, London. We've got Bristol in the house with uh, Philip. We've got Newcastle. Welcome, Sean. Thanks for your question that you sent in already. We have got uh, Chelmsford uh, with Jeff. We've got Mr. Donaldson, Pete, um, from Sterling. Mm -hmm. Uh, how are you doing, uh, Owen, um, from uh, Liverpool? It looks like we've got a good mix um, representing uh, a large portion of the country, so we like that. So now you exercise your fingers as well, um, and um, I would love it. Really appreciate it if you kind of uh, get involved um, by interacting uh, using your question box. That would be uh, absolutely fantastic. Um, it's been a really cool week for me uh, uh, so far, Rob. Um, it's been cool, but it's also been a bit stressful. Um, we've um, uh, been testing the C300 Mark II firmware update. Okay. Um, so um, we, um, I managed to kind of get the early hands-on to the beta, um, and uh, we got it yesterday. And the image that you see right there in front of you is literally us doing a test with the new firmware update for the C300 Mark II. Um, so uh, that's why I look a little bit tired and a little bit frazzled because <laughs> we're having to communicate with Europe and Japan and kind of um, looking at what's coming um, for the C300 Mark II. So um, it's a really exciting kind of a firmware update that's going to bring a number of um, new things to the camera. Um, C300 Mark II with C-Log3 um, is very, very interesting, um, and it's really cool to be among the first to kind of get to get to play with that. Yeah, sure. um, so it's a new log curve, um, and it also just shows how Canon are now starting to play with keeping updating the technology. Like if you invest in a in, in a camera now, like even the XC10, the C100 Mark II, the C300 Mark II, um, it's almost like a platform. So when they give you the camera, they're still working on it. They're still listening to our feedback, and um, comes from people like myself, but also from uh, your, you know, your your feedback mm -hmm. from your customers as well, um, those who use the camera, and then they're frantically trying to work out what is possible um, just to keep the camera moving forward as a platform. So very exciting to be having um, a play with that. It's also a bit stressful because uh, you are when you're working with beta, you're working with not an end product, and you're kind of scratching your head, going, ah, oh, what, what's what's changed, what's new, what needs to be fixed, etc. So um, that's been uh, that's been really good fun. Mm, exciting stuff. Okay, so those of you in the room, um, can you let me know whether you shoot um, weddings, corporate, or both? So I'd like to know, please, if you shoot weddings, corporate, or both. Um, that would be fantastic. Hop in now, and uh, we will start to get a little bit of a tally, and we can try and all move this conversation in certain directions and um, also I should point out this the, if we end up talking about weddings and there's a lot that do corporate or vice versa the key thing is to try and apply the principles to both yep. right because um, now having shot both um, I'm benefiting from what I learned from wedding space and trying to apply that to the business now um, as we move ourselves um, move ourselves forward um, oh, great, some new faces to join the room as well. Hey, how are you doing, Dan? Um, and we've got PR. I take it that's an abbreviation as, as well. Uh, Matt's in the house. So, so we've got a lot of corporates, um, and we have got a number that do both. Okay, so it looks like we're doing quite a, a, a good mix. Pete, hey, Pete, um, you do corporate as a full-time, and then you do weddings on the weekend as freelance. Um, and... Pete, does that mean that you you essentially you freelance for other people, so others have got teams, and then you kind of get involved with with their businesses? Let me know; I would be interested to uh, to find out. Um, for myself personally, um, I started off when I was I would say very young, doing um, inverted commas corporate video, um, and then I came up with I had a really tough year um, during one of the economic downturns, and as a 21 year old um, doing corporate trying to persuade companies to give me decent sums of money um, things started to dry up 
and, and I did a couple of weddings and I really enjoyed them. Uh, but what weddings gave me is it gave me predictable income. And what I mean by that is I was in a position where I could see a wedding booking coming next year in June and I knew how much was there and I could see, okay, right, so I've got a booking of a thousand pounds or whatever the fee was. Okay, can I cover my rent? Can I cover my food bill, etc.? And then I would look at the month afterwards and go, okay, I can see that I've got a nice spike there. But then the month after that is quiet. I could move the money from June to cover a bit of October, for example. And I really like that. That's the one thing I love about weddings is that you can map out your your, your kind of income over the course of a long period of period of time. But with corporate. Um, what you get is you get the ability to get larger jobs, but sometimes it's a bit more nerve-wracking because um, a job comes in last minute and it's like, go, go, go. With a wedding, there's generally not so much last minute. It's yep. it's quite planned out um, and kind of uh, uh, well thought out down to the company's kind of decision-making. Um, Pete says, for weddings, I work for myself at the moment. Okay, Pete, uh, awesome. I, I guess as well, when you know, when you're starting out, you've you've got that nervousness that will I ever get another job once you've done one job. So just yes. having that predictability is is is, is key in that organisation, and that's obviously some of the things we're going to touch on is that you can be very creative, but you've got to keep an eye on the budget. You've got to keep an eye on the fact that it's your livelihood. You can't yes. just you know do things just because it it, it, it looks great. So it's that balance. That obviously, you're going to be discussing and, and expanding on yeah hundred percent look you know the the aim is is that we have businesses that grow and we want to become known and we want to be recognized um, being recognized by peers is nice but the key thing is we want to attract business um, to ourselves and I, and I and I say the word attract because in an ideal world what we want is we want people to come to us yeah. so how do you start to get people to come to you or well, if we produce work that is the same as everybody else, then it, it, you, you don't attract anything because there's no buzz factor. Do you know, when we were shooting weddings, just to make clear to those of you who, who are not familiar with myself, is my background was originally with weddings and now we shoot corporate and commercial work. So I, I probably did, I did 10 years kind of weddings, uh, maybe just over. Um, and then I got to a stage where I kind of decided that, um, you know, enough, uh, it was enough, enough was enough. Do you know the key thing actually was more family? Um, I, for me, with weekends, um, I wanted to get my weekends back for my family. Also, we were being massively creative with what we did for the wedding space. So what I decided to do is I, I wanted to be pushed even further and corporate gave me that platform because we started to do some crazy stuff that people don't need to do for weddings and it was because I needed that creative fix. Yeah. Um, so now um, Vivida kind of shoots um, really um, mostly corporate and commercial. Um, my main client is Barclays, that's who I do probably the most work for at the moment, Canon as well, which is mixed because it's Canon ambassador work but also we are a creative agency for them as well. Um, and then uh, certain clients work through agencies. So there's some clients we have a direct relationship with them. I prefer that. But often some of the big jobs come when you're working through an agency. So there's sometimes you've got to have a bit of a, a balance there in how you approach things um, uh, and what you, you know, what you kind of, uh, depending on what you do and, and, and what, you, what you need. Um, so with getting creative, um, for me, it meant that it resulted in getting more customers. And I have to say, it's definitely easier being creative in the wedding space. You don't kind of think that that's possible. Because, you know, the thing is, with weddings, they are highly predictable. You know what the outcome is going to be. So it means that because you know what the outcome is going to be, the end result and the edit can become very, very predictable. So the aim is is to try and find ways of making what you create interesting. Um, so we did that by really getting to know our customers. So when we go to, I mean, let, let's say we are working in weddings, we, we've got a client, how can we become, um, how can we get creative? It's always for me by starting to 
uh, understand the customer and trying to understand their personalities um, and, and what makes them unique and what makes them what makes them different. If I can get to understand my client, and I could say this could be a wedding client or it could be a corporate brand that we're working with, if I can start to understand them, then I can start to put together a creative brief that suits them. Now, when, you, when I say creative brief for a wedding, most people don't think, oh, that doesn't exist. A, a question for you, those of you who are out there, how many of you um, do a creative brief for a wedding? Those of you that are in the room that shoot weddings, how many of you do a creative brief? And then in a minute, I'm going to ask the same to those of you who are involved in corporate. Do you find, uh, Simeon, that when you are doing speaking to a wedding client, obviously the stress factor possibly for those guys is going to be higher because it's their one day in a, in, in a lifetime, hopefully. So they want to get right. Whereas when you are talking to a corporate, you're talking to a professional, so they can be a bit uh, disparaging in terms of you know, you know what's happening. So do, do you find that that's... Yeah, the, the conversation is different. Um, we got to do some very, very big budgets with weddings. Um, so it meant that when they're spending their own money, sure. things get a little bit more stressful um, because they've got more to lose. They're actually losing their own money. When we work with a big corporation, surprisingly, they don't have as much to lose. What they have to lose is if you mess up, it makes them look bad, and that yeah. means that they don't look good in front of their superiors. And at the end of the day, those that I deal with, they just want to look good in front of their business. But when you're spending someone else's, when you're spending your own money, um, it gets a little bit scary. And I'm often dealing with parents because it's the budgets of parents that it, you know, that's where the money tends to tends to come from. Uh, so a few more comments, please, to come in. How many of you um, do a creative brief if you're involved in weddings? Um, and then now also if you do corporate, um, how many of you do creative briefs when you are shooting for a corporate client? Let us know, please. That'd be awesome. Okay, here the can see the keyboard's typing. When you press your keyboard, we know about it um, because we can see it. Um, so that's it. We can start to see some of the keyboards uh, coming in and typing now. Okay, always. Okay, so Dan says always. Fantastic. That's probably on the corporate front. Uh, corporate, 95% of mine create a treatment normally. Okay, that's a key thing actually that um, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it right. Lorna um, mentions that the creative brief comes from the company. Yeah. Um, corporate, yes, always. 75% of the time for corporate work. So when you work um, with, um, oh, I beg your pardon, Lon. Um, when you work with um, corporates, then you sometimes get a creative brief given. I like it when there's a little bit given to me, but we get to create it ourselves. Um, we do this by making sure that we understand the brand values of the client. Yep. Um, and this works whether I'm shooting a wedding or shooting something that's corporate. When we work with, let's say Canon, if we shoot something for Canon, they have a thick brand manual that says, um, when you start the video, can you please make sure that the logo appears for five seconds or two seconds? And at the end of the video, it needs to be this and it needs to be in this order. If you use type on the screen, it should be this font, it should be this size. If you shoot because of the brand values, uh, could you make sure that any lighting is like this or it's like that or it's quite natural? Um, with Barclays, it's exactly the same thing. Uh, they have a very thick brand manual for video that dictates and gives you some constraints and restraints as to how you shoot the video, how you put the edit together, what type of music you use. And the aim for myself as a video is just to push it just a little bit. But we have to build trust first. When I first got the, you know, a couple of big clients, what we ended up doing is actually just doing, I acted predictably. So when I got a big corporate client, we went and we shot predictably and we produced the type of material that they would expect. Once they then built up trust in our small agency, then we started to get creative and we started to push things outside of the box. 
So you find that when you have a corporate and you have a relationship and then that person is either promoted or leaves and it, it's almost back to square one again to build that trust up? Uh, yes, um, you actually touched on quite a sore point for me. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Um, so um, I, one of our clients, Unilever, um, we had a really good working relationship with them uh, and we still do but it was much better. I had built a relationship with an individual within Unilever who started to love what we do. They were they were kind of really promoting us and we were getting a good amount of work through. But then one day he got a new job. And all of a sudden, my major in was gone. And, you know, I had projects lined up. Some of them disappeared. But then I didn't have another contact in place that meant I could get new business. Um, and... If I look at what the account is worth in value um, a year ago against what it's worth today, it's dropped by probably 70%. And that's all down to that one individual leaving. Yeah. And it was because coming from weddings, I kind of like, I, I didn't value relationships in quite the same way or building relationships because what happens with weddings, it becomes a little bit more transitory. So you build a relationship for a short period of time it's very intense, and then all of a sudden, poof, it's gone. Um, and then you move on to another client, which is probably through a referral, but it's the same thing. You have a client for a period of time, and then they go. But then when it comes to corporate, the business is based on having the same client, but repeating business time and time again, which for me was linked with one person. Um, what I should have done is I should have, every time I went out to meet with, with the client and I was hanging out, I should have been making contacts. Hey, how are you doing? What's your name? And I should be making a note. What I now do, um, this same thing happened to Lawn. So Lawn says exactly the same thing happened. Um, exactly. It can, be a, it can be an absolute nightmare. Um, what I now do, my approach to this when I'm working now with corporate clients is I'm, I'm chatting with them, I'm conversing, but at the same time, as I do an introduction, I'll be memorizing the name, even if it means I have to go to the toilet and I have to quickly go into my phone and type in the name and the title, etc. And then I will now add that to a customer relationship management package. So I'm using like a sales force. I use Nimble at the moment, nimble.com, which is a, it's just something you can start to record contact details in. And I can set a reminder to get in contact with that person. Yep. And I start to build up contacts within that business so that um, I'm in a position to nurture more relationships. If one person goes, I know who my next contact is. Um, can I, with Barclays, I've got one really good contact there that I work with a lot, but now I've started to be known throughout others in the team. So if that one individual went, I would have a good relationship with his boss and those who are on the same tier and some of those who are underneath. So that strategy is, is, is very, very um, important. And it looks like it's a sore point. Looking at the, 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 the comments here, it looks like uh, there are more than just me who's been affected by that. So, sure. um, so, so that's a good takeaway from this webinar then, is that that's something you, is, you, know, you need to be quite keen to do rather than you know, to expand your contacts, not just rely on one person because it could all disappear definitely, tomorrow. Yeah. Definitely, definitely. Because when you have a conversation, your aim is to kind of say, you know, yeah, I was chatting to John and uh, and, I, and I met you know with, with Sally the other day. I noticed she likes this and likes that. And the more names and the more people, you, your aim is to actually become like their employee, as if you work within their business and you understand their business so well. For us, yes, it's the brand values. For us, it might be the technical elements. It might be understanding how to get the permits and passes to get the stuff done, the language they use. Um, understanding the business but also understanding the people within the business as well um, is massively important okay some questions here just looking at what we've got on the board uh, uh, Pete says I'm reading this live here um, I just meet with clients for weddings and ask them what they are looking for I don't really write a brief but I have an idea as to what I'm going to shoot for corporate there's always a creative brief so for me the interview space um, where I have a consultation with a wedding client is massively important. Um, it helps me then start to understand them. So the picture of the couple I got on screen, when I, when I started chatting with them, I realized um, by talking to them that they were heavily interested in fashion, right? 
Um, I could see it was kind of apparent. Um, I got an understanding of what was important to them. Um, and then as a result, um, I was able to produce imagery and video content like this that really tapped in to their aesthetic and, and, and what they liked. It also kept it very interesting for me because that couple is very different to another couple. So the picture I've got on screen now, the picture I've got in now on screen, you know, I've got flipping guns in the shop, right? This is a wedding client. Right, and you can see there that I've I've got a SWAT team, um, and I, it's, we're having fun because I realised with this client what we needed to do is we needed to be able to have fun with them because that that was that was them. They were like, we want to do something quirky, we want to do something different, and when we started to chat with them, I realised that I could push things creatively in a particular direction. Um, so you know that becomes really important. You know, what's important is, is that you try and make sure that you include your own personality um, into your work, but also your client's personality. And that comes by two things. It comes from understanding yourself, what your own likes and dislikes are. Uh, yes, having your own agenda for what you want to create. What type of work do you want to produce? Who is your ideal client? Um, and then the other thing is, is to work out what the personality of your client is. If it's weddings, you are literally trying to dig into what makes them tick. If it's corporate, then you are trying to understand the personality of the business, as well as keeping your contact happy, because they've also got likes and dislikes. And if they don't like something, they're not going to pass it up the line. So... I try and understand my own personality and then we try and make sure we inject personality into the work that we do in order to make what we do different. So um, for those of you that can kind of see the screen now, this is an opening frame from a wedding video. Um, can I, for those of you that can see the screen now, um, let me know if you would use this as the opening screen in a wedding video. Give me a yes or give me a no. And I don't mind if you say no. <laughs> okay, cool. I can see from your keyboard meters that uh, we have uh, lots of people typing away. Oh, man, this is coming in. Okay, uh, no, no. David said, no way, exclamation mark. Um, Owen says, no. Um, it looks like an absolute... Um, no, Pete says it depends on um, what she's doing. So she's definitely <laughs> yawning. Okay. Um, so she, she, we do an interview. Uh, I roll the camera, and one of the things that she does in this video, uh, or when we're filming her, is she yawns because she's tired. This is the end of shooting. Um, I, I was flown to Texas to shoot an engagement. Right. So I had a client call me up and go, Simeon. I want to propose, I should put this in a different way, I want to propose to my fiancé in Texas in four days' time. Can you fly out with me in two days' time? And I was like, yeah, how many people can we, can we fly out? I can just afford to fly you out. I was like, all right, if the profitability is there and the adventure is there, then I'm, I'm, I'm up for it. So we went for it. The, the client that you can see on screen now, um, that's Gurav on the right-hand side. And that's him in my office hanging out, right, um, as we are packing and going through the plans. So uh, we fly and land into uh, Texas. She proposes. We do this proposal, or he proposes. She says yes, um, and I do an interview. And at the end of a very long day, as we film, she yawns. We start the video with this, right? The video starts with her going, <sighs> And then she goes, oh, you're rolling, and she cracks up laughing. What we do at the beginning of the video is we make sure that we start with personality. I knew from her personality that she was a kind of a happy-go-lucky. She doesn't take herself too seriously. And I want to make sure that every single video we do in an ideal world starts off with something different. Weddings are predictable, and, engage, and a proposal is predictable because we assume that if she had said no, then the video would not be aired. So it means that we're in a zone immediately where the creativity potentially starts to spiral downwards. 
So when people hit play, I need to capture their attention. So what we start to do is I grab your attention. The first frame and first part of this video, the camera is wobbling as I adjust the camera and she's yawning. And then she cracks up laughing with this raucous kind of Texas laugh. And from there, we've, we've got the hook. The other thing in the video, this frame that you see on screen now, this is with me with a Canon Legria Mini X. It's like a, it's a small um, handheld camera, wide angle um, lens. I'm recording content on that camera and I end up in their video, right? And most of you and most of us, we would kind of go, no, I, I'm the guy that creates the video. I do not feature in it whatsoever. And I said to him, um, why have you booked me? He said, because I know you can capture it in a really cool, creative way and you're going to do something different. I said, cool, so let's do something different. And I'm going to start the story, not when, we are, when you do the proposal in Texas. Right? The shot that I'm going to put on screen for you now, if I can find it, this is what we would expect the video possibly to start with, right? Mm -hmm. That this is the typical. This makes it into the video because this is a key element of the story. But I said to him, I'm going to start the cameras rolling before. So what we did is I started the cameras rolling when he came to the consultation. Um, and then we kept this going. So when we were inside the airport, um, I was rolling the camera, a little Legree Mini X. Um, when we were in the plane, he had his own camera so that as we were recording, he, he could shoot his own user-generated content. I'm trying to see if I've got a frame from it anywhere that I, I, I put in. I had so much content to try and get in here before uh, we, maybe not. So what I did, this Canon Legree Mini here that I've got, I've got more than one. And I gave him his own camera and said, dude, this is yours. This is how you use it. Record and shoot and have fun with it. I then take that content and I put it in the video. Um, I'm traveling with him, Legria Mini X on the dashboard, I'm in the background, right? So I get involved. I can't cut myself out. So when they're dancing, I'm dancing. And we, it wasn't what people would expect. And as a result of this particular project, I then started to get other really interesting, cool and creative projects as well. I thank you, Pete, for your feedback on that. Um, yeah, it was a, a different approach, um, and it was an, a, this type of approach meant that I ended up getting my corporate clients, because clients like Barclays actually came from watching weddings, um, ironically, because those who watch weddings have other jobs. You know, they, 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 they work in various roles. Um, when we start to understand our clients as well, corporate or commercial, what we then start to do is we use that information to aid us when we do an interview. So um, here is an interview um, that we've done for a wedding, but we've lit it and we've done it as if it was a corporate project. It's the same ethos and the same mentality. And then what we would do is we would always make sure that we push ourselves um, creatively when we are shooting. So here, you know, we shoot. With, we used to shoot with a Steadicam. Now that has been upgraded to a Movi M10. Um, so I will shoot with a Movi. Hey, for weddings, we will also use it for corporate projects as well. Because kit is important, and it does make a difference. It's not always the most important thing, because it's what you film that is the most important thing. But it really does make a difference to kind of make sure that you are working with the, the correct kit um, that will help to tell the story. Um, if you understand your client, and the client is very, very low-key, um, very subtle, very controlled, very reserved, it does not make sense to start bringing out Steadicams and Movies, in my personal opinion, because the two are polar opposites. Uh, a Movie and a Steadicam, they're, they're about movement and being vibrant and, and, you know, lots of, you know, I wouldn't start spinning the camera around the individuals and the couple or around my client. I would maybe go for sliders and keep everything very, very controlled and keep things very, very elegant. So I change the kit depending on the client, which comes down to understanding your client, understanding their brand, 
But with um, videos, with, with weddings as opposed to corporates, I guess the personality, because you're not working with a professional actor yes. in terms of a wedding, I guess their personality can change with the pressure of the day. Yes. So things and shots that you thought you'd be, you'd be able to get, now they just don't want to do it. And can you, can you give me 30 seconds you know, to the camera about how you're feeling? I'm yes. not going to do that anymore because I'm so tense. My mum's over there, my sister's over there crying, this yeah. is happening, the cake's rubbish. Yes. You know, you get, oh, you've got to accommodate all of that. So what we do is we plan for both scenarios. Um, on screen right now, what you will see is a brainstorm of mine. From this is, this is when a client comes into my office, I would do a spider diagram like this. I used to do it in pencil, like what you see on screen right now. But now I use an app called Simple Mind. I should have got a shot, shot of that on screen. But um, Simple Mind is an app for an iPad or an Android, for example. And I would do what you see on screen. I have the client in the center. Um, and then what I can do is, I, as I start to discuss things, there are branches that come off that discuss their likes and their dislikes. I might say to them, give me three words that you would use to describe um, your partner. And then they would come up with the three words um, for each other. Tell me what things are important to you. So for Krishna that you see on screen here, on, she, she, she's a makeup artist. Okay, so makeup is important to you. So maybe filming the bride preparations becomes something that's significant. Let's look out for that. Um, there may be other things. What about music? What music do you like? Uh, that music might inform the music we choose for the edit, or we may take notice of the DJ that they choose, for example. If someone is obsessed, if a bride's obsessed with shoes, then we would sit down as a team and we would decide how can we tell the story and show that she's obsessed with shoes. It could be that we get a shot when her when she's getting ready and we get the shot of the shoes on a beautiful cushion. Or maybe as the shoes are being put on, we might get a shot then. Or as she gets out of the car, we may decide that instead of having the main focus on a big wide shot on a monopod, let's go on a slider down on the floor so that as the door opens and her foot starts to come down and hit the pavement, bam, we've got that shot. Well, as she walks down the aisle, could it be that we get someone on a slider low down so that we focus on the footsteps as the dress shimmies up and her foot pokes out and, and carries, carries on going? We would probably start to include more of those shots in the wedding. So what we end up doing is we have um, key anchors so that we can follow the story as planned. And we can also, if we need to direct, and then we also look out for anchors or elements of story that may happen on the day. If it starts raining, can we include that in the wedding story? You know, st don't stop recording. Or if they're late, let's say they're running late. I'm going to give you all a scenario, right? So um, Serena and Dilraj, um, they were um, a, a, a a client, a wedding client, and on the day, it's traditional that the bride arrives at the wedding um, before the groom, and she hides in a little side, um, a side room inside the temple, and then the groom arrives, okay? On this day, she was running late, later than I had seen a bride before for an Indian wedding, and the groom was there already. So instead of going, flipping it, guys, we need to rush down to the location. We need to get ourselves set up. Um, let's not record any of the frantic nature of the family. Instead, we communicated with the team by phone, by radio, and then we said to them, guys, um, if you're there on location at the temple, look out for anyone looking at watches. All right? um, can someone get a shot of the clock that's on the top of the temple? Um, if the groom is agitated, find him and find him pacing around. If someone is on the telephone trying to communicate with the bride to find out where she is, record that. Okay, bride team, can you get a Legria Mini? Can you clamp it to the inside of the car? Don't tell her that the camera is there. Um, just press record and get a shot, and we're going to record the entire journey. So we did that. Legria Mini X, in the inside of the car, she gets in. Oh, oh my gosh, great, we've got to go. Put your foot down, put your foot down, we, you know, and then the phone rings. I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm, I'm nearly there, I'm round the corner. 
And then she drives in, the car drives into the temple area and she cowers down low. She goes, oh, oh my goodness, the groom, he's over there. I can see Dilraj. I'll make sure he can't see me. We're recording all of this. Guess what ends up in the edit? That beautiful material, that real life footage ended up being in the edit. Now, we partly need to expect this because I would ask questions like, which one of you is the person that's on time and who's the late person? And we would be prepped for that. But we were also prepped for finding a story thread or a story anchor that we could react to live. Instead of everyone sitting around going, hey, it's running late. What should we do? All right, let's just sit down and chill out and have a Red Bull and have a chat and watch Facebook. No, instead, we turned it into something that would push us creatively and then would have a major effect on the end result. Sure. Can I just flip that the other way in terms of corporate, which obviously is a lot more predictable because yes. you've got actors and you've got you know the set thing. Um, and I think we've all done it. You get into a, a, a rut in terms of, right, I'm going to do a wide shot, this shot, that shot. And you get into a routine and it's nice and easy and you're comfortable with it. So you get another client, but you just use the same, almost the same, um, you know, storyboard. Yes. Um, so have you got any techniques of how you force yourself to break from that and say, yeah, I know I'm comfortable with doing this shot, this shot, this shot, then I do top and tail it, edit's done, I get, you know, I get the paycheck. How do you force yourself from that into saying, no, I'm not going to do that this time, it's Barclays, I know I could do that, mm. but I'm going to do something different. I'm going to push myself on a limb and do something creative rather than what I know I could do in my, in my sleep almost. So what we try our best uh, to do is once we understand the, the client, look through those guidelines because believe me, normally every client should have a major point of difference so that you're, you, you, each client should be different from one another. But then what you try and make sure that you do is if you're working for the same client, sit down and go through the ideation process as much as possible. So what we end up doing is we sit down together as a team and we have a brainstorm, essentially. Um, we come up with ideas of how we can push ourselves and put things in a different, in a different space. Most of the time, our ideas are blue sky thinking. We go really big and then we have to rein it back. Um, also, we pitch ideas to the client because often it's just a matter of getting them on board with creative concepts and, and, and ideas. We have to tease our clients with what's possible. The difficulty is this, right? Is your portfolio has got a lot of the same old material. And um, actually you're touching on something I'm doing right now, right? And um, our corporate portfolio is not as creative as our wedding portfolio was, that, if I'm being honest with you because what we needed to do first is we needed to build trust within the corporate space by doing partly what people expected and we were being predictable. That was important. Consistency is key for a brand, for our brand. We need to be consistent with what we do. So what we ended up doing is we started to shoot personal projects or passion projects. When I say personal, I mean our own projects for ourselves. Those of you um, in the room, there's quite a number of you there, can you let me know, um, how many of you get involved in shooting content for yourself? How many of you shoot content for yourself where there is no client, um, there's often no pay involved, um, and you put together, not, not just the test, but you put together your own shoot for yourself and your own edit? Let me know now. That would be great. Okay, cool. I can see the bar moving on the uh, on our screen here, which means your keyboards are coming to life. The attentiveness has increased because I know so many of you have to multitask. You're working um, and then uh, you are listening in the background, which we really appreciate. Thank you. Um, okay, so we have some that do. Um, Lauren, you do, you do time lapse. Um, Jeff doesn't. Um, Okay, so this is interesting. We have um, Owen that does. Um, okay, Dan says, sometimes hard to find time, but you do if you can. Okay, Sean, spot on. Do you know that's exactly what I've done? 
So um, I've done some charity work because, you know, there are, for me, we realized that there was a massive similarity between the type of work that we wanted to do um, for large corporations and work that would be um, more charity orientated. So um, what you see on screen now is um, me and Ghana a number of weeks back. This was a paid project, but it was in a way a, per a personal project because what we did is Vivida massively added to their investment, right? Um, this was a project um, that wasn't, um, you know, they couldn't have afforded what we did for them. So we started to create something that was cool, that was in line with my own brand for Vivida, in line with the work that we wanted to get and wanted to produce. So, um, Lorne, what I would ask you is, you, you say you do time lapses, but is it time lapses that's the type of business that you want to get? Like, do you want to be shooting time lapses for a living? Or do you do it because it's creative and it's fun and you enjoy it? As a hard question, I'm looking forward to seeing your answer. Um, what have we got here? Okay, Jeff also does some charity work as well. Um, so you do these time lapses in corporate work often. So what I would say is, Lorne, I would, I would probably just flag this a little bit. Like, this is good because you start to refine your technique when you're shooting time lapses. Um, but I would ask, you, ask the question, could you show a time lapse to a client and getting new business purely because of the time lapse? The answer may be no, because what you possibly are concentrating on is a component of the video, not creating an overall video from beginning to end. So what I, I had a, a, some ideas for some projects we wanted to do. Um, and part of my team now is a girl called Emily, a lady called Emily. Um, and she comes from brand background. Um, and she said to me, right, let's take a look at the personal projects you want to do for Vivida. And she crossed the line through half of my ideas because they were things I wanted to do, not things that would move the brand forward. I would create this cool video, but it would not help get the next piece of work. So to come back to your question that you asked earlier, what I end up doing is to push ourselves creatively. If something does not currently exist in the portfolio, but it's a style of work that I thoroughly believe believe in, I will create that piece of work. There, um, a client of ours, Mars, um, they do some small projects with us, and they came to us for video and said, hey, can you do this project? It's a really cool animation piece with some really cool work abroad in countries like Africa, looking at the raw materials. We did not get the project. And I partly believe is that they trusted us to create the work, but I didn't have the necessary assets in place to be able to prove the creative concept that I was pushing. People buy what they see. So what did I do? I invested in shooting this project in Ghana, in Africa, so that I could create something that was on a level whereby they can look at like what you see on screen now, this image, and go, if he shot with his team, we would be delivering this type of standard. When I was in the meeting, they could not see this, so I don't believe I got the business. And when it came to the animation, I had nothing to show them. So what did I do? We created an animation, so that now my aim is, in a month's time, we're going to create this into a case study, and I'm going to send this to Mars and go, hey, I'm... I was disappointed we didn't get to work together. Um, I really hope the projects went well for you. Um, I'd love to see them. But here's a couple of links to a couple of projects that we did that we feel might resonate with you. Um, and in that way, we're, we're, we're pushing, ourselves, uh, pushing ourselves forward. So that's a really good example of this balance, isn't it, between creativity and business. Because yes. as you say, you've got 10 creative projects you know, that you could do on your own, but you're selecting which ones you do from a business perspective so that that helps you in your business, helps you get more work, and therefore helps you move forward. Too so. right. Yeah, 100%. That's why a lot do short films. It's just for me, short films are not going to get me the business I need. Um, 
I invest. So what I tend to do, um, I could invest my money, any money I have in equipment, I'd do that. I, I could invest other money in, I don't know, stock market or, uh, or a villa. I don't know, a villa. In, in a some, villa. In property, a jet, in, even. Now you're getting the idea. Um, <laughs> what I decide to do is I take a portion or a percentage of each project. And, and let's say there's a project that's £10,000 or £5,000 or £2,000. If I was to just take off 5% of every project and put it into a separate pool, you may find that halfway through the year, you've got enough to hire a location, to rent in that piece of equipment from visual impact that you didn't have before um, for a shoot, right? Um, or purchase just a little thing to add in, and then we go and we shoot and then we create, right? Um, and we will then, that keeps us going, and now we will have a roadmap. We've worked on this now. The video will have a roadmap so that we will start to work out what things we want to shoot. I would thoroughly recommend um, rental as well. Like there are times where we do not have what we need or we just want to try something or we realize that there's a different look we can create but I focus too much on the equipment I have and I own. I just rent it in. If it's a lens, if it's a diffusion panel, if it's a HMI light, if it's an easy rig, um, I rent that in. So, so here you can see, um, I was uh, when I did a workshop here at Visual Impact, I was um, loving the Easy Rig. I got you to get it available for me, and as a result, that's what we did. I went to Ghana, and as you can see, I'm wearing a full Easy Rig setup, and I shot with it. Sure, I returned it, um, but now I will be buying one I, over a period of time. If I start to rent something more than six or seven times throughout the year, I may then decide it's worth me saving up for. Um, hey Colin, how you doing? Uh, no problem for missing the beginning um, of the talk. Um, your question here uh, is a change of subject direction a little bit. I think it's probably a good time to do that. Sure. Um, Colin asks, um, what format do you deliver your final uh, product? So it really depends. Um, Colin, do you shoot weddings or do you shoot corporate? I'll try my best to kind of cover both. When we shoot weddings, um, or when we did, we used to shoot. We used to shoot and provide Blu-rays, but man, it was a killer in terms of the workload. I hated it. Um, so what we now do is we now provide USB. Okay, so we'll call in its weddings. We now shoot. We edit on Final Cut Pro, um, and then after that, um, I deliver on USB sticks. No menu creation. <sighs> um, I drag and drop the files on, and we do an MP4 format. So they can go on iPads, but also will work well on PCs. We try and make sure the files are not over four gigabytes, because on PCs, sometimes they don't like it. Um, Blu-rays, like you do, um, I had to do covers and all the rest of it. I looked at my business from a business point of view, and I, we spent a bit of time looking through what bits of the workflow were an absolute pain and an absolute bummer. And I tried my best to remove those steps. right? Um, uh, and that's what we would end up doing. Blu-rays, uh -uh. printing, um, burning, printing the labels, and I'd get the flipping name wrong after I had burnt it, and I'd have to go and do it all over again, and I'd send it to the client and go, hey, no, I've got a DVD player, not a Blu-ray. Ah, forget it. I put it on a USB, and then everything becomes much easier. It's important in business to work out how to make your life easier. Um, that's the same thing when it comes to equipment. Um, you know, we were... The editor was spending time um, going through footage and finding that we had missed focus in certain areas. So then we would look at things and go, hey, can we use autofocus? Okay, C100 Mark II, autofocus, fantastic. We're up and running, or an XC10, et cetera, whatever the flavor may be. Um, grading, you know, we, we, were, we were grading um, too much. No, let's go for a Kelvin white balance. Everyone is going to be locked into the same balance white balance and we're going to make sure we get it right in camera. So we need a look from a camera that looks good out of camera. I use C-Log and C-Log 2 and now lucky enough to be playing today with C-Log 3 um, and I know I have the ability to grade. Corporate projects, yes, but when it comes to wedding work, no. I want it in camera and I want things looking correct. So I will create a profile on the camera that has a particular warmth to it. 
um, a particular saturation. We may move our white balance in the Kelvin to make it slightly warmer so that when we're shooting, um, things are coming out the way we want them to um, straight out of, of, of camera. Because as Lorne says, grading can drain hours in the edit. Why? Because you're kind of going through this creative process and you don't really know, you know, do you want to create a look? Do you want to kind of, you know, make it look accurate? And, and the aim for me is, is like with this shot, this shot you see on camera is straight out of camera. Uh, it's not auto white balance. This is just my trusty um, 5D Mark III and I've warmed up the image to make it look right in camera. Um, whatever we do, this is another image. This is straight out of camera. Um, what have I done? We've shifted the white balance so that it's warmer. So that, as Lorne says here um, on Messenger, he, we avoid going down that rabbit hole where we end up doing more work than we need to do. Uh, it, it, look, if, it, if it's trying to push things creatively and that's in line with my brand, then I'm going to go for it. Yes. Um, the key thing is to work out what makes you different. There are some brands where the grade is going to be the thing that makes them different. Fine, go down that route because it's a differentiating element to the business. Sure. Um, we asked earlier, do we go 4K or don't we go 4K? Um, with the move from SD to HD, I was not the first to market. In fact, I waited a year, two years. Others were shooting 4K. No, shooting HD because I wanted to get a particular look. Um, I also realized that um, I didn't want to spend money at that point of time in hard drive space, etc. So I wasn't first to market. But then the moment the DSLR revolution came out, we were the freaking first to market, right? Um, because I wanted us to, to have a different look. When the Moby came out, we were on the pre-order list and we were the first to get, one of the first in the country to get the Moby and then to implement it into our workflow. We had to decide as a business what made the most sense. So if I was shooting weddings right now, would I be investing in 4K? I would be looking at my clients. Um, if you're shooting weddings that are a grand, grand and a half, two grand, I would probably, I may would probably say, no, I'm not gonna shoot 4K, unless I can find a way of making sure that I pass it on to the customer. However, I might be in a position where I decide, if I start offering 4K in the markets that I play in, I could start to say, hey, 4K is coming round the corner. You're going to be watching your video in two, three years time. And you know your TV is going to be 4K, right? So let's go down the 4K route. And for this, I'm going to charge you this much extra. Could be an upgrade. Um, or it could be something that you just go for as standard for your company. And, and if it's an upgrade, sure, it might be something I decide to buy the cameras to do 4K for it, or I may simply rent in the equipment for that particular job. I'm going to go right. I'm going to bring out this particular camera. I'm going to and I'm going to make it and I'm going to make it work. Um, I work out what suits the business um, and and try and make things uh, make things work. Thank you uh, for liking the image. Uh, uh, some of the feedback there on there online, yeah. we like that. What about corporates? Are they very much sort of cutting edge? Are they like 4K or they're a bit sort of reticent to the whole thing? Um, they, um, with many of the corporates I work with, the bigger organizations, unless you're working in advertising, if you're working in the advertising space, then sure, 4K is nice because it's kind of a bit future-proof. But if it's advertising and marketing, sometimes they don't want 4K yet because the video is not going to be seen in six months' time. It will become old. I work out what's the product. If the product lifespan is a product that's going to be changed, um, let's say, i us try and take an example of a product that's coming out. Let's say it's a laptop, right? And you know that they're bringing out a new laptop in six months' time, right? And does it make sense to shoot 4K if this video is not going to be seen in six months time because they will move on to a new ad. I would use that type of logic to decide what I'm gonna do. However, owner of a C300 Mark II, my personal projects are shot in 4K. Why? Because I wanna future proof those particular productions. 
Um, there are some clients that I just want to eat, push over the edge to sign on the dotted line. And if I go, hey, I'm shooting your video in 4K, they ask the next person, go, are you shooting 4K? And they may go, no, we're not going to shoot 4K. And it might just help me move over the edge. But in my notes, I say delivery uh, may be, will be provided at the best resolution suited towards your business infrastructure, which may well be 1080p. We are in this really unusual in-between zone. I invested in C300 Mark II because it was the best camera for me at the moment, and it was future-proof, um, particularly as now they're starting to upgrade the firmware and make things more, more interesting. Um, but there is a massive balance. Also, the C300 Mark II for me is an amazing 1080p camera. Yep. In 1080p, with a 444 color space, 12-bit, it's pretty damn nutty. So it makes sense. And then when I go 4K, if I go 4K for every product, I'm still in business, um, and it still works for me. But it's it's I, I, I focus on what I need for my business right now. And every single one of us in this room will make a different uh, different decision. Um, Okay, so we've got Lorne, you're judging the difference in price between, say, C300 Mark II and a cheaper um, FS5. Um, I think it really depends on what's important to you. Um, I am, I'm, I'm lazy when it comes to editing. So I want my colors to come out really well um, in camera. Um, and if I'm working with a log curve like C-Log2 and now C-Log3, I do want to be able to make that conversion from a log curve into video that we are used to seeing with the correct saturation, correct shadows, and the correct highlights. I want to be able to do that easily. Um, Canon make that very, very easy. Um, also, um, the price between the C300 Mark II, the, the price has changed. Yes, That's right. the yeah. price has yeah. changed. Yeah, yeah. Um, so for those of you significant looking at price a significant down, price shift, so yeah. for those looking at a C300 Mark II, um, there's a significant price drop, which makes it more attractive. And then I'm playing with the new C300 Mark II firmware, probably the, one of the only people in Europe to have it right now, and it does make a difference to the camera. C-Log3, um, Lorne, is somewhere um, between um, C-Log and C-Log2. Uh, and it's very, very easy to grade. You've been used to using wide dynamic range. Um, that price uh, there, uh, you check on the visual impact. Whether, I'm getting a nod from the people yes. here at Visual yes. Impact. We're getting a, a, a yes, yes, yes. Um, feel free to chat to the guys here. Um, they can go for any questions. They've also got direct access to me as well. Um, so that's, um, that's not a problem um, at all. Uh, no problem at all. Hey, people. Um, uh, thank you uh, very much for uh, for listening in. And um, are there any questions that um, you wanted to ask and we haven't had time to go through? I know we're just ticking over the twelve o'clock mark. Hey, thank you very much. Thanks for that feedback, people. Those comments. And um, if you've got any little questions that we can just sneak through now, that if you're happy, yeah, just yeah, a couple yeah, of minutes. Give hey, thank comments. you, uh, Colin, for listening in. I appreciate that. Hey, Dan. Much, much appreciated. I'm loving this kind of live feedback. And, and also, those of you who are listening on the replays as well, we say thank you very much uh, yeah, for, sure. for, for listening. Um, no problem, Owen. Appreciating the good ideas. Um, feel free to follow uh, me on uh, Instagram and Twitter and Facebook um, under my name, Simeon Quarry. Um, you will find me there if just doing a bit of a Google. If there's any questions as well on anything, feel free to just... Um, to yeah. drop me a drop me a line, no problem, Nick. Um, awesome, Pete. Thanks a lot. Um, yeah. I, th I think we'll wrap it up in a minute. Thanks yeah. a million again, Simeon. No problem. Um, it was really informative. I mean, the hour just flew past. It was great. <laughs> right. I hope it did for everyone else. So, um, really appreciate you coming along. Hope those who were listening enjoyed it and got a lot out of it. And we'll see you again next time.